Okay, let's begin. We've got a lot to talk about today. So to start with, if your name ends in Santos or, or after that, alphabetically after, you're going to take the exam in Royce Hall, Royce 162. So there's a picture of the building. There's a layout of it. And then here's my announcement about that. So if anybody has any questions about this, you can always send me an email. But we're going to do this so that people have more space, so we're not all clustered like sardines. We got, um, we're going to get a Zoom feed going. So if anybody has any questions to ask Charles or Jacob um, in the other room, I can respond to those immediately. Uh, so it won't be any different from taking it in this room. It'll just be like two combined rooms. It's going to be much better than last time, I think. I took feedback into consideration. The equation sheet is taking forever. I'm really wanting to do a great job on this equation sheet. It's taking a long time. You can ask anybody. Nobody's ever done what they had me do where I, they're having me teach two new classes at the same time. That's considered unheard of. It's, uh, it's, so I'm very busy. The point is, is that I've been doing like 16-hour days and I'm going to get the equation sheet done in time, but I can't get it to you earlier than like maybe tonight because of that situation. But I will get, to, I will get it to you. It's going to be way better than the last equation sheet. I think I can get everything on one page at most too. Um, and the, the typing and everything, it's going to look way nicer. So that's that. We've got a lot to cover today. Um, as far as the exam content, expect anything from chapter 29. We talked a lot about uh, Faraday induction. We did a lot of things there. So anything from there is fair game. Definitely review slide wire generator. Definitely review alternators. All these things, Lenz's law. Um, chapters 30, you really need to understand all of the stuff going on with the mutual and uh, self-inductance, those topics. Also, the, the basics of the circuits. That's when the circuits start a little bit. And then chapter 31, obviously, RLC, RC, RC, uh, RL circuits. And we'll go through that today. So we're going to finish. Today is going to be our final uh, bit of material. I added a few slides. It's not material that we haven't covered. It's just that I added extra slides because I wanted to do more in-class examples to give you the most comprehensive uh, lesson review that I can. So part of this is final review, okay? Some of this is going to be review for the final today. You're going you're gonna to see stuff that's topics that are going to be covered. Not final, sorry, midterm too. You're going to see topics that are going to be covered on the midterm today for sure. Okay, so let's talk about reactants. The reactance is the ratio of voltage amplitude to current amplitude for a resistor in an AC circuit. And it's equal to its resistance. So resistance is sort of this thing that um, applies to AC circuits as well. But remember that resistance is not defined in exactly the same way if we have an alternating current as it is with direct current. So we have to modify this concept a little bit, and that's how we come to reactance. For a capacitor, the reactance equals the reciprocal of the product of the capacitance and the angular frequency of the current. So right there, you can see there's a difference here. This angular frequency of the current that we have now that we have a, uh, a sort of sinusoidal oscillation going on, that's going to come into effect. And we have to take that into consideration for these alternating currents. So here's a summary of the relationships of voltage and current amplitudes for the three circuit elements that we're going to talk about that are going to be covered on the exam as well. Uh, inductors, capacitors, and resistors. Note again that the instantaneous voltage and current are proportional in a resistor where there's zero phase difference between VR and I. So the instantaneous voltage and current are not proportional in an inductor or capacitor because there's a 90 degree phase difference, which we talked about in those phasor diagrams last time that I put out on the board there. Review those uh, lectures if you are curious about that. So here's a figure that shows the resistance of a resistor and the reactances of an inductor and a capacitor and how they vary with angular frequency omega. Resistance is independent of frequency. 
while the reactances XL and XC are not independent of the frequency. So you can see here, resistance does not respond to omega. It's just a constant. But the re uh, reactance is, and the inductance as well, uh, or actually the reactance is for the inductor and the capacitor is what I mean. Okay. So, if omega is zero, then we just have a DC circuit, right? Yeah, that's by definition, because then there's no oscillation, it's just direct current. And there's no current through the capacitor because XC goes to infinity, and there's no inductive effect because XL goes to zero. And then in the limit that omega approaches infinity, XL also approaches infinity, um, then we just have like an extremely rapid oscillation. Yes. Yes, thank you for reminding me about that. Okay. So, in the limit that omega goes to infinity, XL approaches infinity, the current through the inductor becomes vanishingly small. And then you can see that the self-induced EMF opposes the rapid changes in current. This is from Faraday's law. So, in the same limit, XC and the voltage across the capacitor both approach zero. The current changes direction so rapidly that no charge can build up on either plate. It's like it doesn't know what it's doing. It's chaos. It's just going every which way. Nothing can happen. Interesting that you can create a current that can do that, that goes so fast that it prevents a capacitor from charging. It is possible. So here we have um, an application of the above for reactants to a loudspeaker system. So we've got low frequency sounds that are produced by the woofer, which is the speaker with the large diameter, and the tweeter is the speaker with the smaller diameter, producing high frequency sounds. So we, we all have seen this many times in our car stereos and everything. In order to route signals of different frequency to the appropriate speaker, the woofer and tweeter are connected in a parallel across the amplifier output. There's a parallel circuit there. The capacitor in the tweeter branch blocks the low frequency components of sound, but passes the higher frequencies. So the inductor in the woofer branch actually does the opposite there. So here's a picture of what we're doing. We've got our circuit here that we have, and uh, there's the crossover network for the loudspeaker system. And then we've got our inductor and capacitor that feed low frequencies mainly to the woofer and high frequencies mainly to the tweeter. So then we've got graphs of the RMS current as functions of frequency for a given amplifier voltage. And the two speakers in this loudspeaker system are connected in parallel to the amplifier. So there's the picture of that. Okay, now we're going to talk about LRC series circuits. Many AC circuits used in practical electronic systems involve resistance, inductive reactants, and capacitive reactants. So here we have a figure showing a simple series circuit containing a resistor, an inductor, and a capacitor here, and an AC source. So um, we've already studied RLC without a source, but now we're going to study one with a source. So here's the phasor diagram for that. It's a little bit more complicated. So we've got our... Um, source voltage phasor and it's the vector sum of VR, VL, and VC phasors. So this is kind of interesting. It turns out that you know how we did all of those uh, phasor diagrams separately? We did one for resistors, then we did one for inductors, then we did one for capacitors. I drew all three of them out on the board last time. Well, it turns out that when we connect all of those and give us an AC source, we get all three of them at the same time. And even though a phaser is not a vector, they still add like kind of like a vector, like vectorally. They, they still obey this principle of linear superposition where we can put them all in the same plot. So that's really what you're looking at there. You're looking at uh, three different uh, phaser diagrams for the fa voltage phaser for VR, VL, and VC. So you can see here, the inductor voltage phasor leads the current phasor by 90. So there's this one, and then we've got um, 
all of the circuit elements have the same current phasor. So this I applies to all of the voltages, the one for the inductor, the one for the capacitor, and the one for the resistor. And then the capacitor voltage lags. So this VC down here, it lags the current phasor by 90 degrees. We remember that from last class. It's thus always anti-parallel to the VL phasor. By anti-parallel, we mean out of phase by 180 degrees here. We've got this 180 degree angle pointing in the opposite directions there. And then the resistant resistor voltage phasor is in phase with the current phasor. And that's all in line with what we learned about last time. So this is just all three of them put together in the same figure for this LRC circuit. If XL is less than XC, the source voltage phasor lags the current phasor, X is less than zero, and if phi is a negative angle, then that then phi is a negative angle between zero and minus 90. So we've got this situation here. We have the RLC series circuit with an AC source, and we've got this omega. That's the frequency there. So the frequency is always occurring, but then we have this relationship, this angle, angular relationship between VR, VL, and VC that's always preserved. So this thing might rotate, because it's a, a phaser, rotate with time by omega t, just like making rotation like clockwork. But all of those angular relationships are preserved as we go about through a rotation. To analyze this circuit, we'll use a phaser diagram that includes the voltage and current phasers for each of the components. Because of Kirchhoff's loop rule, the instantaneous total voltage across all three components is equal to the source voltage at that instant. We'll show that the phasor representing this total voltage is the vector sum of the phasors for the individual voltages. So here we have these different figures that show the complete phasor diagram for the RLC circuit. We assume that the source supplies a current I given by I is equal to I cosine omega t. Because the circuit elements are connected in series, the current at any instant is the same at every point in the circuit. Thus, a single phasor I with length proportional to the current amplitude represents the current in all the circuit elements. Okay, so we're going to use VR, VL, and VC for the instantaneous voltages, and VR, big VR, big VL, and big VC for the maximum voltages. Um, and then we denote the instantaneous and maximum source voltages by V and big V. Then in this figure, we can see that the, the instantaneous voltage for AD between A and D is little v. For A and B for VR is v VAB as well. And then for VL, it's VBC. So the potential difference between the terminals of a resistor is in phase with the current in the resistor. Its maximum value, VR, is given by this equation, which is just the same for any circuit at all. V is IR. The phasor VR is in phase with the current phasor, and it represents the voltage across the resistor. Its projection, remember what a projection is. It's a projection onto a horizontal axis at any instant. It gives the instantaneous potential difference, VR. The voltage across an inductor leads the current by 90 degrees. Its voltage amplitude is given by this. VL is equal to IXL. So here we see that the XL takes the role of the resistor here. Same thing for the capacitor. The voltage across the capacitor lags the current by 90, and its amplitude is given by XC, so IXC instead of, so XC here takes the role of R. The phasor represents the voltage across the capacitor and its projection onto the horizontal axis. At any instant, it equals VC. So the instantaneous potential difference, V, between terminals A and B, A and D, sorry, is equal to the algebraic sum of the potential differences, VR, VL, and VC. So it equals the sum of the projections of the phasors onto these axes. So we, we don't look at the the phaser in the, the specific direction, we always project it onto that x-axis, and that's how we get our values. And then those, those projected values onto the x-axis 
um, those are what adds numerically, adds or subtracts. Um, and then, so we have the sum of the projections is equal to the projection of their vector sum. So the vector sum V must be the phasor that represents the source voltage and the instantaneous total voltage VAD across the series of elements. So here's the mathematics to describe how to do this. If you're given a sort of RLC circuit, we can use these formulas to calculate the voltage that we can expect to see. So to form this vector sum, we subtract the phasor VC from the phasor VL. And these two phasors always lie along the same line with opposite directions. This gives the phasor VL minus VC. This is always at right angles to the phasor VR. So for from the Pythagorean theorem, we have the magnitude of the phasor V is given by this expression here. So we can write this in terms of its specific components. So I have my voltage here, and that's just given by the vector sum. So we're just doing vector arithmetic here, VR squared plus, and then notice they've combined these two voltages. It's VL minus VC squared. So the resistor, or the uh, inductor and the capacitor voltages, they're considered one piece of this equation. They can just be added together here. And then we just express this by our classic IR expression for a resistor. And then we're going to actually look at expressing the voltages for the inductor and the capacitor in terms of the reactances. So we've got I, X, uh, L minus I, X, C, okay? And then that's squared. And then we can actually write it in terms of the current. We can factor the current out of there because it's in every expression. So I just comes out and then we just have V is equal to I times root of what's inside. R squared plus XL minus XC squared. So you can see here how the reactance has the same units as resistance. It really just is the sort of analogous concept for an AC circuit for inductors and capacitors. Okay, now we're defining impedance. Impedance is defined as Z and this is impedance here. Impedance is this expression, this term right here. It's the analogous concept of a resistance to a DC circuit, but it's for AC now. So we define impedance of an AC circuit as the ratio of the voltage amplitude across the circuit to the current amplitude in the circuit. So we can see that the impedance for an RLC uh, circuit is given by this expression here, this part of it. So V is IZ. Okay. So this equation is valid only for an RLC series circuit. It's not true for any circuit, but we can use it to define the impedance of any network of resistors, inductors, and capacitors as the ratio of the amplitude of the voltage across the network to the current amplitude. So maybe if you go on to do double E, you might deal with circuits that are a little more complicated than this, and you have a situation where you have to take the ratio and do that sort of thing. But for a basic RLC series circuit where we just have three components, this equation is just true as is without modification. So this has a form similar to V equals IR with impedance Z in an AC circuit playing the role of resistance as it does in a DC circuit. We just have R. Uh, just as direct current tends to follow the path of least resistance, so alternating current tends to follow the path of lowest impedance. So if you have two different paths that the current can take, it tends to take the path with less Z there. Note, however, that impedance is actually a function of R, L, and C, 
as well as the angular frequency omega. So it's not just this simple thing that's built into the component. It's a variable. It changes if you change omega or you change out one of the components. It changes. It's a dynamical thing. Just changing the frequency alone is enough to change the impedance. So we can see this by substituting the values for the reactants for the inductor and the capacitor and that gives the expression for impedance in terms of what it is for omega. So we've got this, um, I can just multiply I, keep this equation as is, and I've got my impedance in terms of my omega. So R doesn't change, we just have R squared here. But then look at this term, we've got omega times L, the inductance minus 1 over omega C and that's going to be squared this expression is squared so that's interesting so omega is really built into this in this function um, and so is the inductance and the capacitance so we were talking about earlier about how inductance comes in and Faraday's law of induction becomes important for devices. We can see how it becomes important for circuits now. So for a given amplitude V of the source voltage applied to the circuit, the amplitude I is equal to V over Z of the resulting current, and it will be different at different frequencies. And we can explore this frequency dependence uh, not, not in this class. It's a little too advanced. It'll be like resonance and things like that. We just don't have time to talk about it, but it's interesting to note, and you'll definitely see it in your circuits class. The gas-filled sphere here, we've all seen these at the Science Center. Now we can figure out how they work. Okay, so it's got an AC voltage between its surface and the electrode at its center. The glowing streamers show the resulting alternating current that passes through the gas. So that's what that is. That's current passing through gas. When you touch the outside of the sphere, your fingertips and the inner surface of the sphere act as plates of a capacitor. So you're being a capacitor for an AC circuit when you go to the science center and you touch those cool little glow, glow uh, orbs and you have the little, like looks like plasma coming out and filaments and you touch it and it goes, that's current and that's you being a capacitor. That's pretty cool. And so you're, oh actually, your, your, uh, the sphere and your body form an RLC series circuit. The current is low enough to be harmless, but it's drawn to your fingers because the path through your body has a low impedance. So you're actually kind of playing the role of an inductor too. It's, it's all built into this uh, combination, the person and the current and the gas. The gas is really just there to show the current, obviously. It would work without the gas, too. I mean, you'd have to have a good conductor. But as long as you had a good conductor, even if you didn't see it, it would work. Anyway, uh, so the angle between the voltage and the current phasers is the phase angle of the source voltage with respect to the current. And that's the angle by which the source voltage leads the current. So from the diagram here, we have that our tangent of our angle is equal to VL over VC divided by VR and then I is equal to XL minus XC over IR okay so uh, you two girls in the back can you explain to me why how I got a, this expression here exactly okay so if not that's fine but please don't talk pay attention so Okay, so if the current is I is equal to I cosine omega t, then the source voltage V is V equals V cosine omega t plus phi. So we've got this uh, RLC circuit in which XL is greater than XC. And we'll see the behavior when XL is less than XC. The voltage phasor V lies on the opposite side of the current phasor and the voltage lags the current. In this case, XL minus XC is negative. Then the tangent of the angle is negative, and the angle is a negative angle between 0 and minus 90. 
Since XL and XC depend on frequency, the phase angle depends on frequency as well. Um, that stuff is not super important. That again relates to resonance and things like that. But it's worth mentioning. All of the expressions that we've developed for an RLC series circuit are still valid if one of the circuit elements is missing. If the resistor is missing, we set R equal to zero. If the inductor is missing, we set L equal to zero. But if the capacitor is missing, we set C equal to infinity, corresponding to the absence of any potential difference or any capacitive reactance. Um, and let's see. Yeah, good. In this entire discussion, we've s described magnitudes of voltages and currents in terms of their maximum values. The voltage and current amplitudes but we remarked at the end that these quantities are usually described in terms of RMS values, not amplitudes. For any sinusoidally varying quantity, the RMS value is always 1 over root 2 times the amplitude. So remember VRMS. All the relationships between voltage and current that we've derived in this and the preceding sections are still valid if we use RMS quantities throughout instead of amplitudes. For example, if we divide by root 2, we get this and we can rewrite that as in terms of the RMS. So we've just got VRMS is IRMS times the Z impedance. We can translate these equations in exactly the same way and then we've considered only AC circuits in which we have these in series. You can do a similar analysis for them when they're in parallel but again that's a little bit more uh, detailed analysis than we should do in this course. So, in the series circuit of figure 31.13a, suppose R is equal to 300 ohms, L is equal to 60 millihenries, capacitance is 0 0.5 microfarads, the voltage is 50 volts, and omega is 10,000 radians per second. Find the reactances XL and XC, the impedance Z, the current amplitude I, the phase angle, and the voltage across each circuit element. Okay pull out a sheet of paper and let's work this one together. So first we're going to draw this circuit out and we're going to work this example here. So I've got my circuit. It's coming through here. We've got our resistor here. It's going down. We've got our inductor. Okay. Got our capacitor. And then we've got our source. Okay. So current is going this way and it's alternating current we've got capacitor minus Q positive Q that's the charges building up on the plates okay so let's solve this an RLC series circuit the RMS voltage across the resistor resistor is 25 volts so the voltage across the resistor 25 volts we'll just put that down here and note it. Across the capacitor it's 90 volts and across the inductor it's 50 volts. So note that these voltages are different for all of these elements here. Okay what's the RMS voltage of the source? So we can use this equation here to just figure out the RMS voltage. It's just VR squared plus VL minus VC where I left my voltage here. So this is VR squared and then this is VL minus VC. So it's this top equation. You could also just multiply I times the other thing. But since they gave it to us in this form, it's easier to use this equation. So we plug in those values for these terms here because we know the voltage across the resistor and across the inductor. And then we can use it to solve for that expression there. So then we do that and then we have that the, uh, the source voltage amplitude is 260 and the voltage amplitudes for the inductor and capacitor are given by these. So now we have a slightly different question involving source amplitude.
So what do we do for source amplitude? We want to find a phase angle with the source amplitude. Now we have to use a little bit of trig. So we can use this formula to essentially look at the angle of, in its arc tangent, of VL minus VC over root magnitude V minus VL minus VC. And when you plug in those values, you get the angle. Because we're given the voltage, the, the main voltage V here. We have our total voltage amplitude. That's the magnitude of it. So that's sort of like the hypotenuse of our, of our phaser. And then we've got our VL and our VC. So we have everything that we need to find that angle. So that's what we're going to do for a problem like that. We can use this formula again. Okay, so those are just two little side notes that are related to this circuit example. I wanted to throw those in there as a little bit of uh, use and application for these formulas. Now let's do the circuit example here that we started. We've got the ideas for how to determine XL and XC and Z, so the reactances and the impedance. And we can use it to find the current amplitude and to find the phase angle. So we're going to find the inductive and capacitive reactances. We know omega. It was given to us in the problem for this circuit. We know omega is 10,000. So we know omega is 10,000, and we know the inductance is 60 millihenries. So we've just got this for the inductor then. It's just 10,000, so omega L, 10,000 times 60 times 10 to the minus 3. Okay, so then we get like 600 ohms for this, for the inductor. And then what about the capacitor? It's 1 over omega C. That's 1 over 10,000. So we've got, for the capacitor, 1 over omega C, 1 over 10 times 10 to the 3. And then the capacitance was given as, um, let's see, 10 to the minus 6. Okay, microfarads. Okay, so then that turns into like 200 ohms. All right, so now we've got the impedance of the circuit then is just given by root, uh, the resistor is 300, so we've got Z then is then equal to square root of the resistor squared, and then plus, and we've got this one minus that one, so 600 minus 200. And then, so we have a total of 500 ohms for the impedance. Okay. With source voltage, amplitude V is equal to 50 volts, the current amplitude I and phase angle phi are given by this expression. We have E equals V over the impedance. So it's just like V equals IR except it's now impedance that's, that's doing this. So I is equal to V over impedance. We know V, 50, and we know impedance, so now we know the current. So that's how you find current in a situation like this. And we know the angle is the arctan of XL minus XC over R, so we've got that it's equal to the arctangent of 400 ohms over 300 ohms, and that's 53 degrees there. So the voltage amplitudes for VR, VL, and VC across the resistor, inductor, and capacitor respectively are VR is given by IR, VL is given by IXL, and VC is given by IXC. So now we know the voltage amplitudes. In the last problem, the one that I just did, we were given this information. Now we're using solving the circuit to find that information. Yes, question. Uh, sure, is that the previous slide here?
Okay, well that's so that's that's for this specific circuit. The last one was for a different example with different voltages across. So you would do this you would do this calculation for for this specific circuit here, that's it's given by this expression because that's our reactances for these specific circuit components. In the other example that I did um, sort of as like a little quick example, we had different components. And so for example, this, this is a different circuit with a different voltage and different amplitude voltages across the inductor and capacitor. See how those numbers are all different. And so that's why I get a different value. It's the same formula, but it's different components in this case. So that's why there's two different angles because we actually, this is a different circuit. It's just a quick little calculation to show you how you can do that. If you're given this information, you don't even have to write out the whole circuit. You can literally use these formulas directly for the uh, impedance and the uh, phase angle. So, but then for this circuit, we actually solved it. We found the individual voltages across the circuit elements. So to be clear, for this circuit, we had to find the individual voltages across this and then use that to solve, or well, we found the uh, impedance, I should say, and then we use that to solve for the current and solve for the voltages across it. Because once we knew the current, we could multiply it by the impedance associated with each element and find the voltage across each element. For the other example here, we were just given that information and we just had to sort of plug it in and, fig and do it kind of faster. But either way works, depending upon what you're given in the problem. It's two identical, similar ways to solve a circuit, but in one case you're given the information sort of in reverse. Here we had to do more work. We had to actually find those voltages across. Okay, so for this circuit here, as XL is greater than XC, the voltage amplitude across the inductor is greater than that across the capacitor, and phi is positive. The value phi is equal to 53, through 53 degrees, and that means that the voltage leads the current by 53 degrees. Note that the source voltage V is equal to 50 volts is not equal to the sum of the voltage amplitudes across the separate circuit elements. So you can't do it like a normal DC circuit where you sum the voltages. Notice that 50 volts is not equal to 30 volts plus 60 volts plus 20 volts. Because remember, when DC circuits, you can sum the voltages and they all add up nicely. It drops to zero across. It doesn't work that way with an AC circuit. Instead, V is the vector sum of the VR, VL, and VC phasers. So we have a vector sum instead. If you draw the phasor diagram for this particular situation, you'll see that the VR, VL minus VC, and V constitute a 3, 4, 5 right triangle. That's pretty cool. And we saw that earlier in some of the other slides on the phasor diagrams as well. Let me find that really quick so I can show you exactly what they're talking about. Here we go. So there's our, there's our phasor diagram with the right triangle. And then I'm just going to put that in this slide here so we know what we're talking about. Okay. Okay. There we go. So there's the right triangle. Put a little more space here for it. Okay. So you get the idea there. Great. For an AC circuit that includes an inductor L, a resistor R, and a capacitor C in series, the impedance, which is the ratio of the amplitude of the voltage across the LRC combination to the amplitude of the current, depends on the values of L, R, and C, and the angular frequency of the current. So. For the LRC series circuit, we can, now we're going to find expressions for the time dependence of the instantaneous current I and the instantaneous voltages across the resistor, inductor, capacitor, and AC source. So we can describe the current 
by using 31.2, which assumes the current is maximum at t equals zero. So we're going to use simple harmonic motion. Cosine omega t. I is equal to the amplitude, maximum amplitude of the current, cosine omega t, where omega is the angular frequency of the circuit. So that's what they mean by that equation, simple harmonic motion. And then the voltages are then given by the equations that we just had for the resistor, for the inductor, and for the capacitor. Voltages given by these kinds of expressions here. Omega L and 1 over omega C times the current. So we know that the current and the voltage all oscillate with the same angular frequency. That's very important. The current follows the angular frequency of the voltage. The voltage sets the omega for the current. And thus the same period. So they have the same frequency, they've got the same period. 2 pi over omega, so it's 6.3 times 10 to the minus fourth seconds. So 0.63 milliseconds, that's the time it takes to complete one oscillation. So now we have the current, because we know I is equal to I cosine omega t. So we know I here for this circuit is equal to I cosine omega t. And we know omega, right? It was given like 10,000. So we know that it's, and we know the, the current amplitude is 0 0.10 amperes. We found that before as well. So now we know it's cosine 10,000. And then we've got uh, T. And it's radians per second times T. So the, so the units of this check out. The units of this are what? Radians. Yes. <coughs> now, what about the resistor voltage? It's in phase with the current. So VR is equal to the maximum amplitude of VR cosine omega t. Same frequency, so same omega. So now the voltage we found for across the resistor was 30 volts. So it's just 30. This voltage across the resistor is now just 30 cosine of omega radians per second t. And of course, it's going to be the same idea for the inductor and the capacitor as well. For the inductor, of course, it leads by 90 degrees, so not quite the same. We've got this extra little bit that we have to add in here. So we've got VL is equal to VL cosine omega t plus 90. So it leads it. So for VL then, we don't just have cosine omega t. We've got a phase added into there. So it's going to be um, minus 60 because what happens is they take the omega, the cosine of omega t plus 90, and they turn that into a sine. They use a, they, they basically use um, a trig identity here. And so with the cosine omega t plus 90, that's the same thing as minus sine omega t. So they get rid of this 90 degrees and switch it over to with the trig identity. So we get minus 60 volts sine of the omega. So we've got so we've got some big V times cosine of omega t plus 90. That's going to be some V minus V sine of omega t. And then we know omega is 10,000 and the voltage is minus 60, or 60, so we have minus 60 sine, not cosine, but sine 10,000 radians per second times t. Great. What about the capacitor? So the capacitor lags the current by 90 degrees. So instead of being plus 90, it's minus 90. So in this case, we use another trig identity. Cosine of omega t minus 90 is just sine of omega t, not a minus. So we've got 20 volts 
sine omega t. So voltage of capacitor is Vc cosine of omega t plus 90. Okay? And then it's not plus, it's minus 90. So then we've got, this is equal to Vc sine of omega t. So it's like 20 sine of 10,000 radians per second t. 20 sine omega t for the Vc. Okay? So, now we have, uh, we found the voltages across the various components. And we can see that the source voltage is equal to the voltage across the entire combination of resistor, inductor, and capacitor. And it leads the current by this angle. So now we can see the physical reasoning of what this phase angle that I was solving in that earlier problem is. It's the phase angle of the total voltage there. So it's the source voltage across the entire combination that gets this angle of 53 degrees that we found in the earlier problem. So now we've got our total voltage, little v. And why is it little? Because it's, it's AC. But it, it represents the combination of all the three voltages, uh, the phasor sum of all the three voltages. That's going to be cosine omega t plus phi. Why is it still cosine omega t? Because since the current and the voltages are all in phase, we have the same rotation. They're not, they might be uh, phase shifted, right? For the inductor and the capacitor, they surely are. One's plus 90, one's minus 90. But they still rotate at the same omega. So we can still use cosine for all of the omega. We can still use the same function to describe them. So then we have our final expression for our voltage for this circuit, little v. And the final expression is just given as big V cosine omega t. We know big V is 50 volts. We found that earlier. We know cosine of 10,000 is omega t, radians per second times t. Now we have our angle. Um, they just do a little, uh, you know, basically a little bit of a trig identity here. Not trig identity, just converting from radians to degrees. We've got 2 pi radians and 360 degrees. Multiply that by 53. Now everything's in radians. So it turns out that that 53 degrees is precisely 0 0.93 radians. So now we have our phase that it starts at, its initial phase. It's just like when you start a simple harmonic oscillator. You don't start it at equilibrium. You start it at some shift. That's the role of that angle. It's the same idea here. That's what we're basically describing in this circuit, abstractly speaking. Whoops. I think I jumped a little bit here. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, and we will, after this slide, we will take a 10-minute break. So, uh, actually... Let's take a 10 minute break now and we'll pick it up in 10 minutes from now and talk about the plots of these four voltages. Okay, let's uh, jump back into it. So we've got these, uh, we've got this figure that graphs the four voltages with time. Remember, we've got the VR, VL, VC, and the total voltage. The inductor voltage has a larger amplitude than the capacitor voltage because XL is greater than XC. The instantaneous source voltage V is always equal to the sum of the instantaneous voltages VR, VL, and VC. And you could verify this by measuring values on the voltages shown in the graph at different values for time. So here's our plot of how these things go. So as you can see here, they're oscillating at the same omega, but they're not all lining up because we have this phase shift going on between uh, VR being <coughs> VR, VL, and VC. So let's sort of, you know, let's plot this out really quick. Let's draw a plot of this so we can understand 
what we're looking at here. Uh, I'll use this this chalk here. Let's use some colored chalk. Okay. So we've got our voltage little v, which is like the total sum of the voltages. And then we've got the peak amplitude for VL is the highest. It's 60, 60 volts. And what is VL actually doing? Okay, we've got our time here. Let's plot our time in our cycle. This is in milliseconds. And then we've got our um, resistor. Our resistor is the only one that's at equilibrium that starts at cosine. Because um, it's, remember, it doesn't have a phase shift associated with it. It's just right there at the, um, at the time, at time t equals zero, it's got its maximum amplitude. So let's plot that here. Okay, so we've got this resistor here coming in it reaches 20 and then it starts at some value at 20 so we'll put 20 there should we just do a little bit lower like down here okay so it's 20 volts but that's its peak amplitude it doesn't stay there for long it jumps down and then it's already reaches its minimum at um, and it's actually at 30 not 20 30 so let's go back up to where it was so it's at 30 volts and then it reaches a minimum at minus 30 volts when does it do that it does that through half of a cycle so it's full oscillation is 0 0.6 so at 0.3 so 1 2 3 4 5 6 so at 0.6 it's right back up to where it started. And that means at point three here, it's at its minimum. So it comes down like this and goes back up across. And there we go. That's for our resistor. What about our inductor? Our inductor is out of phase by 90 degrees. It shifted. It shifted in the, uh, which direction is it shifted? So let's take a look at our equations here. So we had that it's shifted some amount. Um, did I erase it? Where is it? Let me go back to the problem. Let's make sure we understand this plot and how it corresponds to it. So the inductor is plus 90 and the capacitor is minus 90. So they're not going to line up exactly with this plot. The inductor is plus 90. So the inductor is in green. So look at this. It looks like um, it almost looks as if it's out of phase by more than that, but it's actually 90. It's really so you should pay attention to this because this is pretty confusing like it's a little bit tricky to actually plot this accurately like they've done here because the inductor is plus 90 from where the resistor is at equilibrium so let's see inductor is in green so that's plus 90 so you can see here and it reaches a higher peak as well a higher amplitude but it's got the same omega so plus 90 actually corresponds to being this distance away from the resistor when it reaches its minimum. So it's like, and then look at this, the total V is the sum. So we've got red, let's do capacitor first, that's actually easier. So capacitor is minus 90. Okay, we can see that. We do minus 90 and we shift it this direction here. So it starts, instead of starting, you know, at the peak here, at the center, 
it's 90 degrees later. So the peak happens 90 degrees after, right? We see that peak. And then now we can see for the uh, inductor, it happens 90 degrees before. So the peak, the inductor starts 90 degrees before the resistor at equilibrium, and the capacitor starts 90 degrees after. Okay, so capacitor, will do it in green. It's 90 degrees after. It reaches this peak right at about, say, almost 0.2. So its peak is 90 degrees. So there's its peak, and then it's actually at zero at equilibrium. Great. So there's the capacitor, and then it comes down a little bit after 0.3, goes into negative territory, um, and it goes down to 20. So it's not as high. Okay. So we got 20 volts for our capacitor here. And then minus 20. Okay. we go okay that's good and then what about so capacitor and then this is resistor Suppo sorry this is supposed to be a little bit higher there we go okay 30 and then finally inductor inductor starts later so inductor starts all the way up here 90 degrees and it comes down like uh, it's 90 degrees out of phase in the opposite sense. So it comes down like this. Let's go 60 here. Okay, so we have our inductor. VL comes down like that, and then it reaches minus 60 at about point. Okay, and then it comes up again, goes to about 0.3, and then it's back up again. Okay, so now we've got those three. Now we have to do the vector sum of these, of these three components. We'll do that in a different color here. So, I'll put my chalk over here. Okay. So, let's do orange for the vector sum. What does the vector sum look like? Little total V. That's in blue here. So, total V is is at a different is different than all of them. It's slightly different than all of them. It's the sum but it has a total as a different phase than the others and it comes through like this it's see it doesn't quite it hasn't quite reached its peak at this point it reaches its peak a little after the inductor but the inductor kind of dominates it and then it comes down and then it's just like a little bit after not quite as high and then back up again and then it makes it a little further in the oscillation the same amount of time. Okay. Actually, no. It's a little bit behind it. This comes down the way they've drawn it. And this goes like that. Okay. Oops. So annoying. Okay. Okay. So, there's, there's our plot of the currents and the voltages. Now, in an LRC series circuit that includes an AC source, the instantaneous voltage across the LRC combination is the sum of the instantaneous voltages across each of the three components. Because these voltages are not in phase with one another, the amplitude of the voltage across the LRC 
combination is not equal to the sum of the individual voltage amplitudes. Okay, so that concludes everything that we're going to need to know for our AC circuits. LRCs, you know that we've got RL circuits and uh, LC circuits. I changed the announcement because we're not doing that other type of circuit. Okay, what about self-inductance for a solenoid? This is important. This is a good review. Okay, so we've got this solenoid. I'm sorry about the text. I couldn't make it bigger and get it to fit on the slide. It's, it's from a homework problem. So I'm going to have to read this through slowly. We're just going to have to get out our reading glasses for this one. It's terrible, I know. But it's worth doing this example. And we've got the time, so we should, we should read it through and understand it carefully. So, to explain self-inductance, it's helpful to consider the example of a long solenoid. So we've got this long solenoid shown here. And the solenoid has only one winding. So the EMF induced by its changing current appears across the solenoid itself. This contrasts with mutual inductance, where the voltage appears across a second coil wound on the same cylinder as the first. So remember, with, uh, with the mutual inductance, there'd be two solenoids. Here, we're just talking about the inductance from this one solenoid. And we've got this distance Z here. Okay? So let's draw, let's draw a picture of this solenoid. Let's put it out on the board here. Can erase this now because we're done with this material for the time being. So we've got a solenoid. It's got some current I and it's wound around a cylinder. Okay, let's do the eye in a different color. Okay, so it goes around like this. Okay. Make it consistent there. Okay, so the solenoid is wound around here, and it's got current I going through like this, and then it leaves, it exits through B here, which is a different label here. B corresponds to like a different point, because we've got point B and point A here. So don't be confused about the two different things. Let me do this in different colors. We've got point A and point B and current I flowing through this solenoid. And it's got a length of Z. Okay. Now, um, we're going to assume that the solenoid has radius R length z along the z-axis and is wound with n turns per unit length so that the total number of turns is equal to n z. That's the total number of turns. Assume that the solenoid is much longer than its radius. As the current through the solenoid changes, the resulting magnetic flux through the solenoid will also change. So the current, they kind of used bad notation here, didn't they? They screwed this up. This shouldn't be big I. If we're going to be consistent, we're going to say little i here. It's changing current. It's not constant. So as the current I changes here, um, the resulting magnetic flux through the solenoid will also change. And an electromotive force will be generated across the solenoid according to Faraday's law of induction. So we've got this this little equation here. Integral of E dot DL um, is equal to minus D by DT magnetic flux, change of magnetic flux. And that, that little M there, D 
just means the magnetic flux. They should use B there, though, because that's what we normally use. But anyway, it's fine. Okay, Faraday's law implies the following relation between the self-induced EMF across the solenoid and the current passing through it. We talked about this in chapters 29 and 30, but let me remind you, it's this little curly E that's a voltage that's equal to minus L di by dt. And for this same reason, this is why inductors work in an AC circuit, for the same idea here. That's why there's a voltage across an inductor, because of this relation. So the direction of the EMF is determined with respect to the direction of the positive current flow and represents the direction of the induced electric field in the inductor. So there's an induced electric field going on here. That's very important. Never forget that there is an electric field induced by a changing magnetic field. That's Maxwell's equations. We talked about that a bit. This is also the direction in which the back current that the inductor tries to generate will flow. And then this is just a little reminder. Self-induced EMFs can occur in any circuit since there's always some magnetic flux through the closed loop of a current carrying circuit but the effect is greatly enhanced if the circuit includes a coil with n turns. As a result of the current I, there's an average magnetic flux, phi b, through each turn of the coil. And we define the self-inductance of the current as this. L is equal to the number of turns of the coil times the flux due to the current through each turn of the coil divided by the current in the coil. Okay, now we're gonna work this problem. Suppose that the current in the solenoid is little i of t. Ignore that big i. It should be little i of t. Within the solenoid, but far from its ends, what is the magnetic field due to the current? Oh, actually, I think they do actually want you to assume that the current is constant here. That's fine. This doesn't make any sense. They say, in one hand, they say big i, and here they're saying little i. I don't know. I think it's, I think it's fine. We'll just try to work this through and see. I don't like the way they did this, though. But that's, it's still a good problem even without this little error in notation here. Okay, so we know that the magnetic field through a solenoid from chapter's last, last midterm is B of T is equal to mu naught N I of T. We remember this from the last chapter. So we know that there's a magnetic field inside of here. And it's, it's far away from the edges but inside the solenoid itself mu naught n times the current i. Oh, and look, it is an i of t, so we are going to make that into a little i. This is, this is fine, or this is fine. Mu naught n little i of t. Either one of these is fine. This tells you it's time-dependent current. There's a t next to it, i of t. And it says it in the problem as well. So that part's done. Now we have to find the induced EMF. We're going to use this B field to find the flux and find the change in flux. That's going to be the next step. What's the magnetic flux through a single turn of the solenoid? Get out a sheet of paper and work this one through. I think you'll, you'll benefit from doing this example with me. I'm going to give everybody one minute to, to get out a sheet of paper and work this one with me. Okay, what is the magnetic flux through a single turn of the solenoid? Let me make sure I gave you enough information to solve that problem. Because, let's see here. We have area A, R. Let's do an R here. Okay, we're going to call this R. So this solenoid has a radius R. Now you have enough information to solve that question that I just gave you. Okay. So let's jump into it. So we've got that the flux is going to be mu naught n i. So it's this, b, and then times pi r squared. So that's easy, because we know that we have the b field impinging through n i of t times the area, which is pi r squared. So now we have the flux for the self-inductance of our uh, coil. Now, 
Suppose that the current varies with time so that di by dt is not equal to zero. Find the electromotive force induced across the entire solenoid. There's an electromotive force, a voltage, induced across the solenoid due to the change in current through the entire solenoid. We can express the answer in terms of the di dt, n, z, and r where Z is not the impedance, it's the length here. That's an unfortunate choice of symbol. Why didn't they just use, well, they didn't use L because we've got inductance, but we're running out of symbols here. Anyway, um, D would probably be better, but just remember, Z is the inductance. Okay, so we found, we found the, uh, the B field and the flux through a single coil last time. Now we have to find through the entire solenoid. So what do we have to do? We just have to multiply it by the number of turns times the, uh, times the, the length. So it's just the number of turns times the length, which is just n squared times the length. And that tells us what we need to know as far as this is not B field anymore, this is total flux. So uh, through this is B one turn. Uh, let me. I don't like that I'm take changing this. Okay, let me just leave this like this. Okay, this is B. This is B one turn. Uh, or B. This is flux one turn. This is flux total. Let's do total. All we're gonna do is just multiply n squared i of t pi r squared times z. So now we've got the total flux here. Total flux throughout the whole thing. That's important. Remember, whenever you're finding the self-inductance, you need that. Okay, so now we found the total flux in terms of the current mu naught n squared i of t pi r squared z. Um, and then these are just some notes going over basics of like in self-inductance in case you forgot. Okay. So what we need to do now is we need to, um, we need to derive an expression for the EMF in the solenoid. If we suppose the total magnetic flux to the solenoid is phi total, What's the, electromag the electromotive force? It's given by this equation. Let me see if it's bigger in the next one. Not too much. Okay, sorry about that. But you can see it here. Electromotive force, and we, we remember this from chapter 29. It's given by minus d phi total. Minus d phi total by dt. So all we have to do is take the derivative of this expression with respect to time. And what happens is there's only one function here that is a function of time. I see a hand. Question. Yes. Because this is, this is turns per unit length, so we need the number of turns times the, the length to get the total, the total number. Before, we found that it was um, the flux through a single one. All right, so let me, back, let me step back through this. Since, since there's a little bit of confusion here. Okay, so the B field is given by mu naught ni, where n is the number of turns. We remember that one, right? So that's the B field. But then we need the flux. So the flux is the amount of B field going through the surface. So we need the total number of turns going through just a single one. So it's through a single turn, there's, there's, the number doesn't change. It's just that still that n. And then we have pi r squared as the area, mu naught n i pi r squared. Now for the total number, remember z is given in terms of the turns per unit length. So we have to multiply it by n z. n z counts up all of the turns and the flux. And that's why it gives us the total. So we have the flux through a single turn, and then we have nz 
telling us the sum of all of them, so we have to multiply by nz to get the total. And that's why it's that's why it's given by that. Okay. So we've got that there, and then we've got um, Faraday's law. This is Faraday's law. Let's apply Faraday's law to this problem. The only thing that's a function of time is the current. So by Faraday's law, we're going to have this is equal to minus mu naught n squared d di dt pi r squared z. That's going to be the induced EMF of the circuit not circuit, of the solenoid. So we've got mu naught n squared z pi r squared. Yeah, and d by dt only applies to the current. That's not written very well there, but this is actually how it works. d by dt only acts on the current. Everything else just stays in front. It's a constant. Okay. So the self-inductance is related to the self-induced EMF by the equation E of T equals minus L di dt. So E of T is this, but then E of T is also equal to minus L di dt. So we can use this to find L. We just, we just pick the pieces of this out that are not di dt, and we have L. So L then is just the constants. It's n squared z mu naught pi r squared. So L is just all of these terms that are not di dt. Mu naught n squared pi r squared z. So the thing that's cool about this problem is that this sort of tells you why an inductor works. This is exactly what the inductor does when it's in a circuit. It generates an EMF, and now we know why, and now we know what the components of an inductor really consist of. We're going to have a coil of wire. It's going to depend on the number of turns squared, permittivity, magnetic permittivity. That's just a universal constant. And then ba basically just the length of it and the area of it. And why does the area matter? Because it's all about the flux, that change in flux and the current. The current plays the role too, right? That's what makes the magic happen, is that changing time-dependent current. But the inductor itself consists of these components. So whenever you see that curly thing in a circuit, you know you've basically got a solenoid. Solenoids are very important, and now you know why. So the minus sign is, again, a reflection of Lenz's law. It says that the self-induced EMF in a circuit opposes any change in the current in that circuit. It states, this equation states that the self-inductance of a circuit is the magnitude of the self-induced EMF per unit rate of change of current. This relationship makes it possible to measure an unknown self-inductance. If we change the current at a known rate, di dt, we can measure the induced EMF and take the ratio to determine L. So we don't even have to know L, we can measure how it responds to a change in current. Current is always easy to measure, even if it's AC. We can measure it, and then we know the inductance. Um, and then, this is in small print here, but I think it's worth mentioning. The definition of the inductance is identical to another definition. The magnetic flux is equal to Li, where the magnetic flux is due to a current in the inductor. To see the correspondence, differentiate both sides of the equation with respect to time and use Faraday's law and you've got this expression, this exact expression here for that as well. So that's another way to arrive at that expression. Okay, um, now if we consider an inductor that's as a circuit element, we're now, sorry, it's this tiny print here. If we're treating the inductor as a circuit element, we must discuss the voltage across it, not the EMF inside it. The important point is that the inductor is assumed to have no resistance. This means that the net electric field inside it must be zero when it is connected in a circuit. 
otherwise the current in it will become infinite. This means that the induced electric field, En, deposits charges on and around the inductor in such a way as to produce a nearly equal and opposite electric field, such that Ec plus En goes to zero. So this is like, this is, we're basically getting all the pieces together now. Now we can see why Lenz's law comes into play. We, it actually happens from an electric field. Okay, we, we talk about it as a, a magnetic field opposing the change in flux. But here we can see that it's actually an electric field. And, and read this again. The induced electric field from the change in magnetic flux, so Lenz's law, deposits charges on and around the inductor. So there's charges that are getting placed on this inductor in such a way that it produces an equal and opposite electric field such that EC plus EN goes to zero. So that's really what's happening. That's the physics of this. It prevents infinite energy. It's sort of like an energy conservation idea. If we didn't have this, in other words, you could, the thing would just get more and more energy. It wouldn't slow down. Kirchhoff's loop law uh, v defines voltages only in terms of fields produced by charges like EC not those produced by changing magnetic fields. Remember, we talked about there's, there's, these electric fields are different. These are non-conservative. So that little subscript there, EC, that means it's a conservative electric field where the charge, it's an electric field produced by a charge. Non-conservative is the electric field produced by a changing magnetic flux. It's not conservative because there's not a charge there that actually exists. We're sort of generating charge from thin air by changing a magnetic field. So if we wish to continue to use Kirchhoff's loop law, we must continue to use this definition consistently. That is, we must define the voltage as this. It's not just, it's not VA minus VB, it's, it's, well it is, but it's this. The integral from A to B, where we're talking about the integral of the voltage across this, this, these two terminals of the solenoid, this is a solenoid, but it's really a piece of a circuit, the way that we're thinking about it at this point. We're treating it as a circuit element. It's the, <clears throat> the sum of that integral along DL. Um, and note that the integral is from A to B rather than from B to A. So finally, the voltage of this solenoid is the integral from A to B of EC dot DL which is equal to minus the integral from that same thing, en dot dl. So what happens is the, the electric field from the charges, from the current that's moving, gets opposed by another electric field that's generated by the change in magnetic flux. And that electric field is non-conservative, but it's equal and opposite. It builds up and it goes there to oppose the electric field of the moving current. So that's the explanation for why Lenz's law really exists. People have been asking me that. What does this come from? What is it really? There it is. It actually relates to the electric fields that are non-conservative, that are generated by the change in magnetic flux to oppose the current and the, the electric field associated with that current as it moves through the solenoid or whatever coil that you're talking about or whatever, not necessarily coil, but whatever loop of wire that where there's a magnetic flux that can exist. So in summary, anything that has a potential current that forms a solid loop that has an area that can have a magnetic flux supported through it can serve as an inductor. But typically we use solenoids because it's a much better inductor. But as you saw in that example with the girl, the girl holding the ball, pressing through it. She's a conductor. She can serve as an inductor capacitor system as well. Okay, so that is self-inductance. So now, which of the following statements is true about the inductor, where I is the current inductor? The self-inductance L is related to the voltage V equals VA minus VB across the inductor through the equation V of T is equal to L di dt which is this equation. They're just calling it voltage, but it's the same thing, is electromotive force. Okay, which is true? If I of T is positive, the voltage at A will necessarily be greater. No, not true. If DI by DT is positive, the voltage at A will necessarily be greater than at end B. Yes, 
that is the correct one and that that involves treating this as a circuit element as well and thinking about how it's it really it's really defined by Lenz's law again right because it's about the change in flux there's a change in flux going through this through this corresponding to these elements and we could there's a problem like this on the homework where you to look at the change in flux and figure out where it's going for a current you have to choose a field point somewhere a field point and you have to say okay where's the magnetic flux going like if I choose right here right the flux is going into the loop so there's got to be something to oppose it so the voltage then from VA minus VB the voltage is higher here than it is here so it's a positive quantity but if we switch the direction of the current it would reverse everything because it would reverse the direction that the flux is going in and it would reverse the electric field that's generated by this change in magnetic flux and then we'd have the opposite case so then the voltage would be negative so that's the explanation for the voltage there okay so finally we consider the effect that applying an additional voltage to the inductor will have on the current already flowing through it so imagine that the voltage is applied to end A so we have some additional voltage source we could hook it's like hooking this inductor up to a new voltage source which of the following statements is true the, so the self inductance L is related to the voltage V is equal to VA minus VB across the inductor through this equation Faraday's law essentially note that unlike the EMF it does not have a minus sign however when so it's a little different but when applying Kirchhoff's rules and traversing the inductor in the direction of the current flow there will be a term minus L di dt just as traversing the resistor gives a term minus R IR and what that shows is that is if V is positive then I of T could be positive or negative while di by dt will necessarily be positive so interesting so V if V is positive I of T could be positive or negative while di by dt will be positive so the voltage really a positive voltage more than anything it affects the change of current with respect to time for a positive voltage source the change in current is always going to be positive even if the instantaneous current was going negative so in other words what they're saying here is they're saying let's say that the current was going this way actually and it wasn't and so it, it wasn't going it was going this way going around the opposite sense this way let's say that was the case the current at some given time is negative it's going this way if I hook up another voltage source here and it's positive that positive voltage source will necessarily make this current less negative with respect to time and instantaneously as soon as there's a positive voltage source but the current itself could be negative at that instant it doesn't necessarily have to be positive it's the voltage affects the rate of change of current with respect to time when it's connected to a circuit element not just the cir the current itself okay now we're going to talk about mutual inductance review and this will be the final thing for today and then we'll have our exam next class so if the current in coil 1 is changing the changing flux through coil 2 induces an EMF in coil 2 given by this expression this is all sorta of review but we will have these equations here in case we need them for our problem solving session here okay now we have a different coil I'm just gonna keep this coil here and I'm gonna modify it a little bit I'm gonna put um, gonna erase this really quick and then we're gonna put like just one let's see mutual inductance okay of a double solenoid okay so we've got this little we're gonna have to put way more turns in it but that's fine just imagine it has a bunch of turns in it 
okay? And then it's got some big turns going around. So there's going to be current flowing from the smaller solenoid and it's going to induce something in the larger solenoid. Okay, the length of this is L now. Length L. Okay, so we're going to consider a field that arises from solenoid 1, which has N1 turns per unit length. The magnetic field due to solenoid 1 passes entirely through solenoid 2. So all the magnetic field inside of this solenoid goes through this solenoid as well. And this so second solenoid has N2 turns per unit length. Any change in magnetic flux from the field generated by solenoid 1 induces an EMF in solenoid 2 through Faraday's law of induction. Just minus d by dt phi. Okay. So, first consider the generation of the magnetic field by the current I in solenoid 1. Within the sol solenoid, what is the magnetic field due to this current? We know this. It's mu naught n i n1 i1 just like it was in the last problem so b1 equals mu naught n1 i1 where i1 is the current flowing through this solenoid i1 and it's a function of t so we got to put that there and i have it there already great okay so, what's the flux generated by solenoid 1's magnetic field through a single tur turn of solenoid 2? We've got this value rho here. What does rho correspond to in this figure? Rho is the radius. So they're calling the radius rho now. Okay, we're changing label. No big deal. Now it's called rho. Same as before, okay? So, we've got this area is pi rho squared so that means the flux then is b1 pi rho squared so flux to turn one is n1 i1 pi rho squared just like just like the self-inductance case so far find the electromotive force induced across the entirety of solenoid 2 by the change in current in solenoid 1. Remember that both solenoids have length L. Okay, so in part B we found the flux through a single turn. Now we're going to find the total flux. So it's mu naught N1 I1 pi R squared. We found the flux through a single turn. Now we're going to find the uh, entirety of it. So we have to multiply it by L. So we have minus, so the EMF through solenoid 2 in terms of the flux of phi 1. So we take this, we take this flux, this whole value here becomes part of this expression for this equation. So we've got that E2 the, the induced EMF for solenoid 2 is minus N2, where that's the number of turns of solenoid 2, not solenoid 1. And then it's L d phi 1 by dt. Okay? L d phi 1 by dt. Um, and then we know phi 1. We know phi 1 is mu naught N1. So we've got phi 1 here. Let's just write this whole expression out. So we have d by dt of phi 1, which is mu naught n1 i1 of t and pi rho squared, pi rho squared. d by dt only acts on this i. So I can just pull this stuff out di1 by 
dt. And this, of course, multiplies by this. So, and then I've got a negative sign. So it's minus n2 l. So yeah, so we put that together. We have minus n2 l di1 by dt mu naught n1 pi rho squared. Perfect. This overall interaction is summarized using the symbol m21 to indicate the mutual inductance between the two windings. Based on your two examples, which of the following formulas do you think is the correct one? It's this one, minus m21 di dt. So all of this stuff here is minus m1. So minus m, so minus m21 uh, is equal to, and we'll just do m21 is equal to n2 l mu naught n1 pi rho squared. There's m21. Everything else is di dt. Okay. Mutual inductance indicates that a change in the current in solenoid 1 induces an electromotive force in solenoid 2. When the double solenoid is thought of as a circuit element, this electric motive force, this voltage really, is added into Kirchhoff's loop law. The constant of proportionality is the mutual inductance, denoted m21. The negative sign in the equation comes from the negative sign in Faraday's law. So we're just doing Faraday's law again, chapter 29. And it reflects Lenz's law too. We know that because of the last example with the self-inductance of the solenoid reflecting Lenz's law. The changing magnetic field due to solenoid 1 will induce a current in solenoid 2. The induced current will itself generate a magnetic field within solenoid 2 such that changes in the induced magnetic field oppose changes in the magnetic field from solenoid 1. Okay, so there you go. I did it already for you. It's, it's there. Okay, so um, that's everything for today. Um, we're going to have our exam next class. Send me emails if you have any questions, but it should be good. Um, I'll see everybody Thursday. Good luck with your studies.